25, now we have to show that using one as the identity, the multiplicative inverse, meaning that for every alpha, there exists a beta that multiplied equals one, right? So now we're going to start the same way that we did with addition, with this bizarre definition of what beta is. Let beta be the set of all p with the following property. Can you help me make the equivalent? With addition, it was that p is an element of beta if minus p minus w was not an element of alpha for some w greater than zero. So we have to write, we have to make a similar definition using multiplication. So now instead of minus, we're using the inverse. So the property is that p is an element of beta if there exists and r greater than one, such that one over p, right? Instead of minus p, it's one over p, times one over r is not an element of alpha. In other words, there's some rational number smaller than p that's still not in alpha, then p is in beta. So it's an interesting thing to me that, I think we all understand this, but it's, for me at least, subtraction is so much more, natural and ingrained than the inverses, even though they do the same thing. So what we're talking about here is that if we have p, then 1 over p is the inverse of p, right? Because if we have p times 1 over p, that of course equals 1. And furthermore, if r is greater than 1, then the inverse of r is going to be less than 1, which is what I showed in the, in the chart. If r is over here, then minus r is going to be down, or then 1 over r is going to be less than 1, and vice versa. And furthermore, if you take a number and multiply it by a number less than 1, that number is going to get smaller. If you multiply it by a number bigger than 1, that's going to get bigger. You know all that, but at least for me, it's not, it's not instantly automatic. It's something that I have to think about for, for just a millisecond before I get it. Whereas the, the, the subtraction is you know, even more ingrained. I don't know why that is, but it makes this, this to me, it just isn't as natural to look at as, as this. But anyway, it's the equivalent. It means the same thing, that we take some R that's bigger than the identity element, and you take, if you have the, the number that you're looking at, you take the inverse of it and multiply it by the inverse of R, then you're still not gonna be in alpha. So if you remember, if this is one, and we have alpha here, and beta's here, so if we have p here, one over p is gonna be up here, and then we're gonna multiply it by something smaller than one, which is gonna make it a little bit smaller, but we're still gonna be able, there's gonna be n r, such that the product is smaller than one over p, but still outside of alpha. That's what we're looking at. So in order to do this, we have to show two things once again. First, that beta is an element of R, then that alpha beta equals Okay, first we have to show, again, we have to verify one, two, and three. So for one, first we need to show that beta is not empty and that it's not everything. So if S is not an element of alpha and P equals one over S times one over two, then 1 over p times 1 over 2, whoops, is not an element of 
alpha. So if we set P to be this, then uh, it's not, then this is the definition of beta. So beta is not empty. So for any, so what we're saying is that for any S that's not in alpha, we can pick a B, a P that is in beta. And why, what, what is, what did we do here? This is just a little, uh, this is just a little more algebra. If we have that P equals one over S times one over two, take the inverse of both sides. So then one over P equals S times two. Then if you divide both sides by two, you get one over P, one over two equals S. We started with S is not an alpha, so one over p times one over two is also not in alpha. Okay, that means it's in beta, so that's the first part. Now, to show that beta is not all of q, if q is an element of alpha, then one over q is not an element of beta. Why is that? That's because if Q is in alpha, then Q times one over X is also in alpha for any X greater than one, right? Because if X is greater than one, then that's less than one. Then that means that Q times one over X is going to be less than Q. And from two, we know that if Q is in alpha, if Q is in alpha, then anything less than Q is also an alpha. But if this is in alpha, then it can't be in B because we need that one over Q times one over X is not in alpha. So this can't be in beta. Okay. So that means that if Q is in alpha, then one over Q is not in beta. So beta is not, is not all of Q. So let's move to the next page, we'll do two and three. So again, for two and three, pick P element of beta and pick R greater than one so that one over P times one over R is not an element of alpha. Okay, so we're just setting the beta, or P is in beta and in R such that that's true. So with those two, if Q is less than P, then one over Q times one over R is greater than one over P times one over R. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that's not what I'm saying. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> Why is this true? Because if Q is less than P, then one over Q is greater than P, and then you multiply both sides by anything positive, and one over Q, one over R, is greater than one over P, one over R. So we know that one over P times one over R is not an alpha. Now we show that one over Q times one over R is bigger than one over P times one over R. Therefore, this has to also not be in alpha. That is B. So if this isn't an alpha, then that means by, the, by definition that Q is in beta and that, that is what we needed to show for two. Because we have that P is in beta, we have the Q is less than P, and we show that therefore Q is also in beta. That's what we need for two. Three. Let X equal one plus R divided by two. Then 
one is less than x is less than r. Okay, so again, here again, we're starting to get more complicated because with the addition, all we had to do was take r divided by two. That was easy. But what we were really doing was taking, if this was zero and this was r, then r divided by two is just halfway between. It's really the average of them. This, this is the same as zero plus r divided by two, right? You add them together and divide by two. So with multiplication, it's harder than that. For, for some reason, addition just works out easier than addition. And I think it's because in some way we privilege addition in a field over multiplication because things like positive and negative are concepts in integers. There is no concept of, there's no name for a, a number being bigger than one or less than one, being bigger than the multiplicative identity and less than the multiplicative identity. So we never learn these concepts as strongly as we do with uh, multiplication. And then furthermore, the way that you go halfway between two numbers is you add them together and divide by two. Well, we can't do that with multiplication. It doesn't look as nice because what we have to do, if we have one and r, then to get the number halfway between, it's just uglier. It's one plus r divided by two. That's, that's this number. And that's the number that we want, and, and we'll use that then to, uh, to prove 3. So we have that x equals 1 plus r divided by 2. So 1 is less than x is less than r. So then we're going to let t equal p times r divided by x. And again, this is also more complicated than it was with addition. Because with addition, all we did was add r plus r divided by two. Here, we're gonna have to do something a little more complicated, but the reason is it's the same thing because when we go through the math, we want to show that t is in beta. So we need to multiply by something that when we multiply both sides, we're able to get rid of the x and or get rid of the uh, the extra x and just end up with something that that will show us that t is also in beta. So I'll show you what what I mean right now. So we have that x is less than r. That means that r divided by x is greater than one. Because if the numerator is bigger than the denominator, then the number is going to be bigger than 1, okay? That means if this is bigger than 1, then we're multiplying p times something bigger than 1. That means that t is bigger than this whole thing. Then th That means that t is bigger than this. So t is greater than p. Oh, because we multiplied this number is bigger than 1. So that means that t has to be bigger than p. So we're trying to prove 3 which is that given p an element of alpha, there's some r element of alpha with r greater than p, right? So that's what we're trying to prove here. So t is gonna play the role of r. So now we have to show that t is also in beta. So we're given that p is an element of beta. And we have that t is greater than p we need to show now that t is also in beta. So we have that t equals p times r divided by x. That's what we started with. That means that, just write it out a little more openly, times r times one over x. So let's rewrite x. So we have that pr, x was 1 plus r over 2, so if we take the inverse of that, it's 2 plus 1 over r. So we have 2 plus 2 over 1 plus r, right? That's the inverse of x. Now, if we take the inverse of both sides, we have 1 over t equals 1 over p, 1 over r, 
and the inverse of this Now notice we're back to x, right? We're getting very close to what we wanted because now we have one over p times one over r times x. So now if we take, if we multiply one over x by both sides, one over t, one over x equals one over p, one over r, one plus r over two, times 2 over 1 plus r, that's 1 over x, right? Cancel these, and that's it. We started with the fact that 1 over p times 1 over r is not in alpha because p is in beta. That means we just showed that 1 over t 1 over x is not in alpha, and that's the definition of beta, right? Therefore, t is an element of beta. That's what we needed to show. We started with p is an element of beta. We found a number larger than p, and we showed that it's still in beta. That's 3. So we've shown 1, 2, and 3. So we, show, we have shown, therefore, that beta is an element of r q e that's all we're going to do now so we've shown that beta is in r what we have to show now is still the hardest part which is to show that alpha times beta equals one so to do that we have to do the two inclusions same as before so we have to show that uh, we have to show that alpha, beta is a subset of 1, and that 1 is a subset of alpha, beta. And as you'll see next week, this is way harder than, than Rudin seems to think it is. It's not straightforward at all. And you can see already here, we've started, it's been creeping in. It's been getting a little harder each step than it was for addition. And now it's all going to fall apart because we can't use square roots, which we need to here. So we're gonna have to get around that problem, which is what makes it so hard. Okay, thank you. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.